I'm used to it not working for me. Live on YouTube. Yes. Just came up on the screen. I think. It's trying to anyway. Yes, that is working. It's trying to anyway. Who's talking? I hear people talking. That seems to be us talking. Or the delay, so I gotta get that off there. <laughs> Who's talking? I hear people talking. That seems to be us talking. There, that should end that. Okay. Anyway, thank you for being willing to do this. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Nice to see you again. Indeed. It's been quite some time, actually. I think we, it was God, like five years ago now. I think we actually sat down at the TCA and talked. Is it really? Yeah. Uh, time just keeps speeding up. It does indeed. Well, I got a, uh, a few questions from a few people who uh, uh, are fans. Then also I've got some from people who are your friends. So you should probably be more concerned about those questions. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't know why I don't have to have glasses on to do this. But for some reason, it's just disconcerting to see a blurry screen. <laughs> I understand that. I don't know. That's my first uh, notable comment of the day. It's very impressive. Thank you. Fire away. All right. Uh, well, uh, Brian Stack assured me uh, that you were once a contestant on the Wheel of Fortune, which I was unaware of. It was indeed. Brian Stack. Yes. When did you see Brian? Uh, I saw him on Twitter. We, we follow each other, and I knew that you guys were old friends. He said to say that Miriam and, and he say hello, and they miss you. Wonderful. I just thought of him the other day, and I cursed. Yeah. I forced him to think of you, so he probably holds it against me now. Forced him to do what? Think of you. So. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, he doesn't like to think of me. So, uh, how, how did the Wheel of Fortune thing come about? Just uh, it was a oh. opportunity, and you took it. <laughs> well, I was out here trying to be an actor and having zero success, and so I wanted to make money. And I chose Wheel of Fortune. I actually, they had rules back then. I don't know if they apply now. But you can only be on three game shows in your life, I think. And oh, oh. There, there's, there are restrictions. One a year or something like that. And you can't do this. It doesn't matter what the rules are. There are rules. <laughs> so I, could, I couldn't do the, uh, the pyramid, whatever yeah. that was called then, $100,000 pyramid. Yeah. Um, I, I qualified or whatever. You have to sort of audition for these things. And uh, so I had a chance to do on that, but then Wheel of Fortune came up too. And I chose Wheel of Fortune because they have returning champions, or they did in those days. Yeah. And you get, even if you lose, you keep your money or something. The, the, <laughs> the point is it was a better gambit for make, making money. Huh. And it's, you know, you, you have to take a test for, for that. They give you, you can oh. imagine what it is. It's like hangman. They... <laughs> They yeah. have some letters filled in, and you have to guess what the others. And um, say there were 15 answers. There were like 100 people in this room uh, <laughs> trying out for this. Oh. And they say there were 15 uh, answers. Yeah. And um, like I said, race car driver, and I could tell it was Mario Andretti. So, okay, <laughs> you fill it in. And I think there was one that I wasn't sure about, and I thought, oh, damn, it's going to rule me out. <laughs> and I didn't get a perfect score. And so we turn him in and the guy heading the thing says, okay, now I'll tell you right now, in order to pass, you had to get five of them right. <laughs> I thought, five? And the whole room moans, oh, no. Geez. I thought, oh, brother, this is, <laughs> this is a cakewalk. So <laughs> I got to go on Wheel of Fortune and, um, and I did well. I got, I answered it every time the puzzle came to me. Mm -hmm. But it was just a little bit of bad luck that it always, you know, came to me with very few. Well, you had to spin the wheel, and I would always land on, you know, a dollar. <laughs> Seventy dollars. And um, so even though I answered, I think I solved three puzzles, but I, I didn't total enough money. And so some, some other lady won. And I got a, 
I get an undrilled bowling ball. <laughs> <laughs> Which I gladly accepted. I never got drilled. I actually, and then I moved back to Chicago a, a months later, I think, because my, you know, my get rich quick scheme did not pan out. I did not take the bowling ball with me. I actually um, sold it. I don't know how much for. It couldn't have been much, but I had a lawn sale, you know, and, yeah. and five dollars. It's a a rolling doorstop. <laughs> Someone bought it though. That was my trip to Wheel of Fortune. Thanks, Brian. That was uh, courtesy Brian Stack, everybody. <laughs> now, there's a thing on the internet that says that you were also on Pressure Luck, but no one seems to have actually confirmed that. Because it's not true. Okay, see, that's the internet lying to me as ever. I was on, um, the other ones I did were Scrabble. Okay. With, with Chuck Rollery. Sure. I just realized I should not eat this thing or I started to eat. <laughs> this isn't going to work out well. Well, I'll allow it. You're not getting paid anything for this. All right, thanks. But I, man, yeah, it's like a chewy snack bar. <laughs> and it's um, not appropriate for being on camera. Um, <laughs> there's a game called Scrabble with Chuck Rollery. Yeah. And, um, and now I can't think of the third one I did. <laughs> oh, yes, I do. Okay. Deal of the century? Oh, yeah. Sale of the century. The thing about uh, that game? Yeah, I did. I didn't win that one either. I didn't win that one either. But I think about that is the questions were so easy. Everyone knew the answer to every question. It was just a matter of ringing in. <laughs> And um, or at least someone knew the answer to every question, and but still wasn't good enough. I realized that I think too late. I thought, oh hell, I'm, just because I watch it on TV and I know every answer, so does everyone who was there. <laughs> like you know, what's the capital of the United States? Or, <laughs> our sixteenth president was I, Honest Abe, blank. <laughs> Starts with L I N C. Ooh. But, yeah, so that didn't go well. None of them went well. It sounds like Celebrity Jeopardy on SNL, whereas you were actually on Celebrity Jeopardy and did very well. I did. That was fun. I um, That was the only thing I wanted to do as far as... I once had a publicist for a very short time. <laughs> and um, it just wasn't for me. You know, I, I don't really want to go on talk shows and stuff. Yeah. Um, but I told her the only thing I can think of that I want to do is Celebrity Jeopardy, if that ever comes up. And I didn't in the short time I was with this publicist, but it came up later. I think I was only invited because the middle was on ABC. Oh, makes sense. Um, <laughs> I'm guessing that's why I was on. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed that, though. That was a lot of fun. I beat that Deborah Messing, that know-it-all Deborah Messing. Uh -huh. Put her in her place. And Vince Gilligan, no less. And the Vince Gilligan, yes. From Virginia, uh, I must mention. Is he? Yes. You know, a, 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 a betting person would probably and wisely have bet on Vince Gilligan going into it. He yeah. seems like the smartest one of us. But not that day. No, sir. Not that day, Vince. <laughs> Let's see. I, I guess I will take you uh, back to the beginning of your career because I don't, even when I talked to you before, I don't think I ever actually asked you what led you down the path of acting in the first place? Yeah, probably what, same as most people. I, Girls. <laughs> well, that, that was one thing that was, <laughs> you notice that there were a lot of, a lot of uh, girls and then not all that many guys that were into girls. True. You know, um, same as everybody did, did stuff when I was, uh, you know, young in school and in high school and stuff. And um, it interested me. And then uh, did it a little bit in college. I, I started late in college. I didn't do plays the first two or three years. But then I did it as a senior. And I thought, huh, I kind of like this. And I'm kind of good at it, I think. <laughs> and um, then went to Chicago with no plan at all. Um, I went to college in, in Southern Illinois or Central Illinois. And so... Went to Chicago and it turns out they do plays there. And um, 
work my way up the ladder a little bit. You know, you do them like at the park district and then in a storefront for free yeah. and uh, small theaters. And then eventually you hope that someone will pay you. And that happened eventually. And that was, that was a great feeling to have your job be, to be in a play. Yeah. And, um, and then I started hearing about this thing called pilot season. <laughs> what we're doing, sure. heading out to, heading out to LA. And I don't think I would have done it when I did, but my girlfriend at the time, uh, wanted to go and so okay we had the same agent and um i don't know if we didn't work much i don't know if it was at that pilot season but i did i was in the pilot episode of doogie hauser i was gonna ask you someone else mentioned that too who did Uh, one of my friends on facebook (laughs) yeah i think that was the only job i got in you know the whole time i was out here at that time (laughs) um but yeah, I was cop number one, I do believe. That um, I believe is true, yes. <laughs> okay. And uh, I once, um, not too long ago, saw Neil Patrick Harris at something. And I mentioned that to him. And he was less than enthused to, um, he, he, he didn't follow the line of conversation into, into more detail. <laughs> just like, <laughs> His response might have been something like, oh, really, or something. He wasn't mean, but he clearly wasn't interested. Um, but that's all I had to, in common with Neil Patrick Harris, except our first name. So he doesn't uh, appreciate that I sort of gave him his send off, you know, his initial maiden voyage. Kids. Kids. <laughs> I was in the cold open. For your information, the cold open, there's a car crash, and the cops run up, and there's a kid there over the body. Get away from him, kid. What are you doing? Want to go to jail? He says, I'm a doctor. Ba-doom. He's like 11 or something. <laughs> and then, you know, roll credits, Doogie Hauser, MD. Yeah, that was that. Anyway, so um, uh, that, that was pilot season. It didn't work out well. And then a, a year or so later, we uh, moved back, uh, <laughs> moving to live here. Yeah. And um, I didn't, I don't think I did anything. <laughs> I, I moved furniture and I taught school as a substitute and then I had a regular gig and then I did a bunch of things that weren't um, acting mm. and uh, the girl and I broke up and I went back to Chicago and met wonderful people like Brian Stack and Miriam Tolan and uh, stayed there for five or six years and, and it was uh, great. I was able to work uh, in theater and at Second City and do a few things and then the time came when I thought maybe it's time to try Los Angeles again and um and eventually yeah that was in 98 that I moved out here again and then in 2001 I believe scrubs happened mm-hmm. so um I got lucky is what <laughs> happened I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that I, I was unlucky before I have to say as far as having no auditions at all and you know mm-hmm. Well, that's not exactly unlucky. That's something else. But, <laughs> but to get uh, to to be able to be on two long running shows is um, oh yeah is mostly luck. But very very good luck, to say the least. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And yeah. you know, I may never work again. I may I may never see me again. All the time, if you watch like an old show or an old movie or something, you think, well, whatever happened to that guy? Oh, I do that all the time now. Oh yeah, I know. I do too. And um, there's there's more than one answer. Sometimes you find out they went into, into directing, or they, you know, always wanted to live on a ranch in Montana or something, and they made money off of Hill Street Blues or something, and uh, and that was it. Specifically, thinking of Hill Street Blues, for those of you old enough to remember that, it's like that was a big cast, yeah, and. Almost all of them, you pretty much never heard from them again. Yeah. And that was a really successful show and award winning and all that. And now you could, you know, maybe I'm being unfair to them. I'm sure they're, most of them are watching this and thinking, hey, what do you mean? I was on this or that. I have so many they, alumni who are followers of mine, you wouldn't even believe it. So you have. <laughs> 
<laughs> it may not be true. But it's probably not true. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, you're tight with Ed Marinero. Oh, yeah. He's going to be yeah. pissed. You, he's going to be pissed? I know. I shouldn't have said anything. But my point, <laughs> well, Charles Hayde, for instance, uh, went on to direct. Yes, absolutely. That's a good example. What would you say? Uh, absolutely, he did, yeah. Yeah, so there's an example right there that uh, you don't know. people Just because they disappear from in front of the camera doesn't mean they've, you know, they're not sitting in audition rooms not being chosen. They're, they're maybe on to something else. Right. And, you know, that could be me. Well, I will hope it won't be. But Well, I hope not. We'll try to do at least something. <laughs> well, I think the, the oldest credit of yours that I found, actually, it's not even a credit. I just happened to find it online, uh, was a, a clip of you doing an after-dinner speech. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Well, I'm glad at least that you know that it's an after-dinner speech because I, I saw that when people posted it and it was uh, Neil Flynn's stand-up comedy. Yeah, that's what they labeled it as, but I, I read yeah. it, that's what it was. <laughs> as, as stand-up comedy, it's it's terrible. I mean, if that was actually a comedy <laughs> act, it's, it's ridiculous. What it was was a speech I did in college and like won some award for giving a funny speech. And so they had the people back to perform it in a live venue. And uh, it was just supposed to be a persuasive speech. And so I did about, uh, let's change the national bird. And, <laughs> uh, and, but then, you know, someone found an old tape and cause that was like in 1983 or something. 83, yeah. Someone found an old tape and posted it online all of a sudden and said, oh, here we go into this world, digging up <laughs> from decades ago and mislabeling it. And so no big crime, but. <laughs> maybe that prompted my uh almost complete lack of participation in the world of the internet i have a facebook page but i don't ever ever go to it or write anything yeah, actually i think that's how i ended up with your email was because you checked it like once after three years and found a message i'd sent you and said you know if you need to get in touch with me <laughs> you better use the oh, other <laughs> is that right yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes like on, I don't know, like looking at email. Yeah. yeah, that's what it is. It'll, it'll pop up and say that somebody said something on Facebook and mm -hmm. once a year I'll press <laughs> on that to see what that person said. And then I guess it led me to my own page and I uh, saw your message from years <laughs> earlier. <laughs> see, uh... Someone was pretending to be me for a while there. Oh, really? Yeah. He, he or she, whatever it was, yeah. said, uh, my, my hobbies or things I enjoy are swimming, photography, and acting. Very, very so, exciting. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it, I'd probably be a happier man if I actually enjoyed swimming or photography, but sure. I, neither one of them do I participate in. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Joel Murray said I should ask you about Chicago Theater Softball League. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I was just thinking about that this morning. I thought of a guy who used to manage our team. Um, <laughs> how does Joel Murray know this is happening? <laughs> well, okay, this is the weird thread that I am Facebook friends, well, with him also, but with Richard Reilly, who said, oh, you should ask him about the uh, uh, the Nun and the Priest movie. Uh and he said, because he's really tall. That's what I remember about working with him. And then I tagged Joel and I said, oh, well, I asked Joel about it in his random roles. And then Joel saw what I was doing. I was going to be talking to you and said, oh, ask him about the softball league. Okay, yeah. Uh, Joel wasn't around. <laughs> I don't recall him being around the, the years that I was doing it. Maybe he was, but I just didn't know him because he, he pretty young headed out to California. Yeah. But, oh, man, that was great because I'm in Chicago. Everybody knows – if you live in a cold weather city, man, summer is everything. Yeah. You know, it, it really only lasts from May to not even September, you can't even say. <laughs> I remember being at a Cub game in September and had to leave in the seventh inning. It was too cold. Wow. We're up in the second deck and in the, in the shade, and this is crazy. <laughs> Actually, we went from there to a softball game. This wasn't a theater league. This was a men's league thing. And um, it was so cold. You know, the ball that we use in Chicago is a 16-inch instead of a 12-inch ball. Okay. What most people think of as a softball is 
smaller than in Chicago. And um, people go, oh, yeah, that mushy ball. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's mushy. If you play with it for a year and hit it with bats 500 times, it ends up mushy. But when you start, it's as hard as a regular softball. It's as hard as a, a globe. Picture slapping a globe. That's how hard this ball is. Anyway, I don't want to ramble. They had a theater league in Chicago, and it was uh, it was really fun. A good, not only playing softball, but it was a, a social thing, you know. Yeah. And um, I think it was Mondays, Monday early evenings, and um, then eventually it was Monday and Thursday, which is fantastic. And of course, you play your game, and then you'd go out for some beers afterwards. And it was, I probably did it for, I don't know, because I was out here for a chunk of time, and so missed it. But I probably did six or seven summers of that mm. a great time who else was on there do you remember offhand on the teams yeah i don't know if it's uh anyone that you would know i, w I would have to think about that mm. like someone that went on to oh you know what I'm, and i'm gonna apologize because i can't think of his name <laughs> if you told me his name i would say yes that's him right Right now, I just can't think of it. He played the older brother on Blossom. Uh, yes, not Joey Lawrence, but his older brother. I know who you're talking about, yeah. You know who I'm talking about. I, I, I could think of his name. I just can't do it. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> we used to have our own sort of a game within a game that he would uh, – he always played left, and I could hit the ball pretty far. Yeah. And so he would um, – and he was pretty fast. So he'd kind of play me in, yeah. daring me to hit it over his head. <laughs> and um, – Sometimes he was able to run after it and catch it, but most times, you know. <laughs> but, um, you know, there's probably other people that, that people might recognize uh, now. But uh, it's a good question. I'll, I'll, I'll send you a name if I think of one. Okay. Well, as I was talking about, uh, mentioning the Cubs, uh, something more me to ask you about being in a major league. Mm hmm And it's Rookie of the Year, where I actually played a Cub. Yes. We shot that on Wrigley Field. That was that oh, was nice. fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, Major League, I think, was the first. It might have been my first on-camera job. And um, and it, I, it, it, it was clear that it was because uh, <laughs> the assistant director, after a, a take or two, came over and sort of whispered, keep going until the director says cut. <laughs> so apparently I would say... Who are these effing guys? And then just sort of, you know, that my one line. And then just sort of, I don't know what I was doing. Look around or <laughs> walk away. I don't know what I was doing, but it was clearly I had stopped acting before the directors had cut. And that's all the director gets to do, you know, is say action and cut. So you got to mm -hmm. let them do, you got to let them do their job. Here's a cat. It is a cat. And a very pretty cat, too. Well, thank you very much. I've never seen it before in my life. Well, even better than yeah. The ugly ones out there roaming. Yeah. And now he's come into my house. So, well, okay. okay. Somebody. I have a dog on the floor, but I'm not going to try to lift her up. Okay. What kind of dog? Uh, I'm not. Well, actually, it's you. Here. Let me see Cameo. Oh, that's a good looking dog. He's very cute. Aren't you? Thank you. Good dog. You're on a camera debut. And she did not lose her mind. That's not too bad. <laughs> um, yeah, Major League, they shot in Milwaukee. So they cast a lot of the smaller parts in Chicago. And um, so it was great. Got to be in a movie. Nice. Yeah. And, 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 and not a bad movie either, especially if you're a baseball fan. Oh, yeah. But I did that. And I think I did... The Fugitive and then something else. You know, always just small parts, but yeah. I was in two or three movies that were that were pretty darn good. And then the first time I was in one that wasn't good, <laughs> I, I was in the theater thinking, what's going on here? How come my movie isn't good? <laughs> and I realized most movies, most movies really aren't good. And, it, you know, this turned out to be the case the rest of my life that you're not... It's a flip of a coin whether the thing you're doing is going to be in any way memorable. Most most things, you know, unless you're a movie star, then, the, you know, 
most of your stuff is going to be good. But uh, if you're just a journeyman actor, taking any part that they'll give you, a lot of it isn't going to be a very, you know, exciting final result. I just watched a lot of Baby's Day Out. <laughs> I was just going to say, I saw that on there too. <laughs> that might have been the one that I was that I saw that I thought, hey, this doesn't seem very good. Um, <laughs> no, no offense to Patrick Johnson, the director, sure. or to Bill Holmes, who played cop number two to my cop number one. <laughs> I saw that scene and thought mostly about how young we were. Then I figure that's probably because it was 26 years ago. That'll do it. Kind of amazingly. But that scene was with, among others, Joe Mantegna, who, who I um, see semi-often around, just around the neighborhood. Oh, really? He's a and he's his a daughter, excuse me, his daughter appeared on the middle a handful of times. Yes, she and, did. Uh, Axel's girlfriend. Say that again? As Axel's girlfriend. I just remembered that. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yes, yeah. that's right. And um, probably when we did Baby's Day Out, she wasn't even born. Wow. I'm guessing. Now that will make you feel old. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's stuff like that. Yeah, I know. Well, today is actually the. Well, today's actually the 21st birthday of what, the daughter of one of my best friends from college, which made me feel old. <laughs> Today is her 21st birthday? Yeah. Well, happy birthday to her. What's her name? Haley. Say it again? Haley. Haley. Yes. Happy birthday, Haley. There you go. You're 21. Get out of the house and accomplish something. Oh, she's even going to school in England, so she's not doing so bad. <laughs> that's That's pretty impressive. Is she in England now? Uh, now she's not, but I think she will be back there as soon as school allows. I'm not sure how they're working their return. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the cards hold for this thing. I'm prepared to go. Well, you know what? I feel like five more months. Yeah. That's what I think. It's um, <laughs> This is no fun, but I, I think we kind of get used to it. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say that my existence has not changed but so much because I'm a work-at-home writer, and my wife actually, uh, she works with autistic kids, so she's still been going into the clinic where she works. She just kind of, hmm. you know, scrubbed down the place every day or whatever, but uh, right. that, that dynamic has not changed. My daughter's the one who's had the biggest change by not going to school. Yes, and I, yeah, I thought of that early on. If this was, you know, if I was 25 and this was happening, I'd be miserable. Yeah. I think we all would have been. So that's one good thing about being older. That's true. Very much so. Well, let's see. I wanted to ask you about uh, what is some of your, your theater work in Chicago. Uh, the fact that you're able to kind of bounce between both improv and the, the Steppenwolf. I mean, that's mm -hmm. definitely diversity there. Yeah, I was, uh, that was, uh, I had some good fortune there. I, um, as a young actor in Chicago, Steppenwolf was clearly the, place most admired you know yeah. the um they did great work and their actors um left eventually although a lot of them came back now and then to be on stage but a lot of them became very well-known actors and rightly so so i wanted to be able to work there and 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 you know with those people and, and i was able to and a couple times and i um that was one of several things I've done that I've thought, well, if this is as far as it goes, I can always say I've done this. Yeah. And um, and then Second City was a complete surprise. <laughs> I was um, I had never improvised at all until I was thirty two or something. Wow. And when I moved back to Chicago, I just wandered in sort of to an improv theater, the the Improv Olympic, it was called then, yeah. and. Uh, Turns out I had an act for it, and a couple of years later, Second City hired me. So I worked there for a couple of years. That's um, a complete surprise. <laughs> if you would have told me, you know, five years before, I'd say, I'm working at Second City, doing what? You know, never dreamed. But it turned out that I spent my time around, you know, funny people and like Brian and Miriam and um, 
Del Close. Del Close. He was. He was. He he partly uh, ran the uh, the Improv Olympic along with Sharon Halpern and. Uh, mm. Yeah, but then but a lot of a lot of talent came out of the I.O. too. Um, well, probably, you know, it used to be when we were there, she would say Andy Dick. And, you know, when people said, who's come from your theater? Andy Dick yeah. and Mike Myers yeah. and a couple other people. But since then, I would say it's been surpassed by people who, to whom she was dropping those names, you know, like <laughs> Tina Fey and Amy Poehler. And they, they, right, they're yeah. probably first in line. Yeah. Adam McKay, you would appreciate that reference, oh, probably. Yes. Um, and then there's me, of course. Oh, <laughs> well, sure. And you know what? That continues to happen, but now I don't know. Like, sometimes I'll run into somebody who's, or or know someone or see someone on TV or something that came from either I.O. or Second City, but I just don't know that because I wasn't there. It's like someone mm -hmm. that went to your high school after you did. You have no idea. Yeah. You always remember who the seniors were, you know, when you were... A kid. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you, you, you remember the popular kids who were older than you, but as far as younger than you, not really. Yeah. So, yeah, that was, um, I haven't done a play in a long time, and I think I would be, well, you get to rehearse, that's the good thing, but I'm afraid I'd be pretty nervous about it. Although it might, it might come right back like riding a bike, but that was very, uh, I very much enjoyed my time doing that. One of the things uh, Brian mentioned uh, that I, I know you've told the story elsewhere, but uh, the time that he said Del Close caught you, Adam McKay, and Ian Roberts fooling around before rehearsal and didn't know you didn't know he was there. Yes, <laughs> you, want to, you want to tell that story? <laughs> well, it's not. Del was kind of serious. Del never really goofed around. He was a <laughs> I mean, he had a good sense of humor, but he wasn't a g goofy really at all. He was kind of, <laughs> kind of stern. <laughs> and not only were we goofing around, he said, what he said was, there were like um, uh, six of us, I think, uh, working with him uh, sort of extracurricularly on this show separate from the, the theater. And uh, so he had arrived apparently and didn't like his time wasted, you know? And so when he stopped us from messing around, he said, if you're quite finished or something like that and prepping us to turn and go, oh, geez, Del, hi, sorry. Didn't know you were here. Let's get started. <laughs> the thing about it is what we were doing, how we were goofing around was the most idiotic. <laughs> it had to do with like an ape flinging his poo. Yeah. And we're just doing it like the same thing over and over. Boom, splat. Hey, whatever the hell we were doing. <laughs> <laughs> Felt like absolute idiots when we realized Dell was standing there. <laughs> like, what, what are you morons doing that's better than rehearsing? So, yeah, yeah, that's funny. I must have told Brian that story. Because he wasn't there. He wasn't there. He doesn't know. Well, yeah, I think you told actually the Del Close documentary is I think is what he said, but uh, oh really? Yeah, but he, he said uh, uh, Adam McKay. Well, actually, first he told me Adam McKay sang "Boopy Doop" circus music, and then he corrected himself and said, "Sorry, I meant boop de boop de boop" circus music. <laughs> yes, that is what I mean. It was like sort of like a calliope sort of thing. Yeah, <laughs> circus music, doodly doo, doodly doo. Ape throws poo. <laughs> Pooh victim says, hey, hey, just those, just ABC comedy, you know, Old threes. <laughs> we probably did that, like did, the whole thing took five or six seconds, but we probably did it like a, uh, like what Vines eventually became. Probably did it like five or six times in a row and to, to Dell witnessed. <laughs> If you morons are finished with whatever this is. Oh, we were pretending a monkey was throwing poo. <laughs> Del? Cuz. Yep. Well, with Scrubs, uh, had you met Bill Lawrence prior to auditioning for the show? Yes. And I'll try to give the brief version of this. 
I was out here doing nothing, teaching school. I mean, not not acting at all. And me and a friend went out and had a beer, and we the, the, the table next to us had two guys sitting at it, and we ended up talking, and they were about to start uh, playing in a basketball league. And do you guys want to play on the team? I said, sure. <laughs> and uh, and so we played on this in this basketball league. And Bill was about. 21 or 22 years old. Mm. Uh, this was in probably 1992, 91 or 92. Yeah, this guy named Bill Lawrence, who I learned was a young writer for a TV show. He was working on Billy Connolly's sitcom. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and then I said uh, at one point, I suppose right around my uh, Wheel of Fortune appearance, <laughs> Um, I'm not going to finish the year. I, I, I got to move back to Chicago. And he said, what are you going to do there? I said, oh, probably theater. And he said, oh, you're an actor? <laughs> oh, yeah. I guess it had never come up. You know, there was no, <laughs> it was never worth mentioning. Um, yeah, and then uh, when I was in Chicago, I saw the credits of Spin City, said co-created by Bill Lawrence. And I thought, I wonder if that's Bill. It probably is. Good for him. And then I moved back out here in 98, as I said, and I did an episode of the Drew Carey show mm. on which Kristen Miller was a regular. Yeah. And shortly after that, a friend said that she's going out to dinner with uh, Kristen Miller and her new husband. I said, who's her new husband? And she said, Bill Lawrence. I said, ask if it's the same Bill Lawrence that, you know. <laughs> and, and so it was, and uh, so me and Bill got in touch. And um, I think he came to see an improv show which led to him uh, putting me on scrubs and allowing me to improvise uh, as the janitor. <laughs> but yeah, I've, I've told this story many times, but I went in to read for Dr. Cox, which uh, John McGinley played and which uh, Bill had made that decision before I came in the room. <laughs> so I didn't even read the, the part. He said... I got to tell you, I already know who I'm going to cast in this part. Um, but you want to read this? And he handed me one or two pages, and it was the janitor and uh, in the pilot episode. And he said, "You, you want? Okay, good. You want to do that?" And I said, "Sure." <laughs> Five hundred bucks or whatever, you know, for a day. And it turned out the last eight years. <laughs> That's what you call a break. It is indeed. Yeah, I know and that, that, uh, over the years. That it was exaggerated somewhat with the Neil says something funny thing, but I, I get the impression that you did have a lot of free reign to throwing stuff in. Yes. People ask sometimes, is it true that you made up all of your lines? And I, no, no, no. That would have been chaos. You know, the other actor never knows what you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to do with the plot or anything. Just, yeah. but um, no, thanks to Bill. I, I got a lot of leeway on um, a lot of times we would, you know, ad lib something or improvise something while rehearsing the scene. And he would say, that, that's good. Uh, say that. And not often instead of what was scripted, but just do another take where you say this instead of that, you know? Yeah. And um, so, yeah, we had that freedom. And, and most of my scenes were with Zach Braff and he was uh, capable also of doing things on the fly. So it didn't bother him at all if we, um, Know, altered what was in the script but we almost always said what was in the script and, and then did takes of alternate um material and only a couple of times did they say where the script actually said whatever neil says <laughs> or or run with it flynn or something like that um that was only a couple of times they actually did that i should have yeah. saved those pages to to prove it <laughs> No, I, don't, I don't know why I get the idea that people doubt me. <laughs> Here's proof. You really said that. I've been enjoying uh, Zach and uh, Donald's podcast. Yeah, I did it once. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't listen to it, even though I told myself I was going to, but I don't <laughs> listen to any podcast. I'm, I'm, I'm missing out, aren't I? Uh, yes, there are quite a few good ones. To say the least. I know. I believe it. But what, uh, I mean, do, do you do this while you're sitting at home working or do I in the car or yeah well I'm in the car more often than not or cutting grass or something I mean some something that doesn't involve sitting at my desk normally right yeah 
there's, there's a lot of good ones. There's a couple of political ones I'll listen to. Uh, there's uh, Al Franken's got one that's very entertaining. Uh, there's okay. a, an Office rewatch podcast that uh, Jenna Fisher and Angela Kinsey are doing, where they're going episode hmm. to episode through the series, and it's a ton of fun. That's a good idea. That's um, it's kind of what Zach and Donald are doing. I, yeah, I absolutely, yeah. I will watch an episode before talking to them. I, even though we didn't talk about the episode much, but I think that's their their you know structure. It is, yeah. It's a little rambling, but I love it. I've been I've been downloading them steadily too. Yeah, good. Yeah, it was good to uh, to reconnect with those guys. I don't haven't seen anyone from the cast in, in a while. I probably still see Bill Lawrence the most often, and that's not all that often at all. <laughs> yeah, I, he uh, went to college at William and Mary, which is right around the corner from from me. So I, that's how okay. he and I first came in contact. I interviewed him for a local local story once. Oh, really? Yeah. What do you mean back back when you were in college? Uh, well, actually, after he, he was coming back uh, for some uh, alumni event at William & Mary, so I, I did a piece for the local paper at the time. So I was, because I was, he, because he was a TV writer. Uh, yeah. Okay. That was made him a big enough deal to warrant local coverage. <laughs> well, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, no, absolutely. When yeah. when when you're somewhere other than New York or Chicago, I, I mean New York or LA, even if you're in Chicago. Uh, <clears throat> professional show business seems a million miles away. Oh, yeah. I mean, I always say that the internet made my career because I, I, I'm here in Chesapeake, Virginia, right next door to Virginia Beach. I, I'm not around anybody famous, really, and yet I interact with celebrities on the phone all the time and they go out to L.A. a couple of times a year when the budget's there and just long yeah. enough to still think it's really cool and not get a swelled head about anything. It's just it's it's never not cool. That's the best part about it. <laughs> yeah, no, I I know what you mean. I I pretty much feel the same way. I feel like um, uh, more of a spectator than a participant in like mm -hmm. um, some event, you know, in an award show or something. Not that I've been to many of those, but I've been to a handful, and you know, it's a uh, it is it feels a little crazy to be there. You're like, wow, this is nuts, and I was invited. What the hell is going on? Um. No, I mostly feel that way. That it's a, uh, it's a, it's a cool thing. I will say, yeah, I feel like you could have been invited to more award shows for the middle. Obviously, I, I was partial, but as, as time passed, more and more people became very partial to that show too. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't have any feelings about that. Like we were mistreated, or no, no, no I don't. It's one hundred percent gratitude that it stayed on the air and and that people liked it. But um, yeah, a lot of people seem to feel that it should have been considered at some point for awards. But yeah, that's okay. <laughs> I will say what impressed me most about that show, and obviously I've reviewed it for many years, but just it never really slipped, I didn't feel like, as far as the storytelling goes. It, there was never really anything that was a jump the shark moment. There was nothing where it felt like it went downhill. It was always following some unique, different aspect of the family life that made it continue to be interesting. I think you're right about that. It didn't, uh, definitely there wasn't a jump a shark moment uh, where we thought, oh, brother, you know, <laughs> they won the lottery or they yeah. wake up ace or something, you know. No, they never did that. It was very consistent. And uh, um, all the way through to the finale, I thought it was very true to itself and, and never got desperate. Yeah. Didn't change much. Well, the good thing is that I don't know. I suppose this is the good thing. The, the, definitely the good thing is that the, the kids could um, carry a story. Yeah. Uh, and the kids changed over time. You know, they, they, hell, they grew eight years. So you could have them in relationships or going to college or, you know, that sort of thing. Their life, the characters' lives changed without having to force it. Right. When you're young, those changes ha happen automatically. It was interesting just the fact that they were also, the, the actors themselves were talented enough that they were able to evolve with the material. Absolutely. Yeah, that's what I mean, that the, the actors could carry a storyline. Especially early on, um, Sue was sort of a breakout. Uh, Eden Cher playing Sue, and uh, thank God for that, you know. The kids, yeah, the kids were, didn't have to be, 
I don't know, hidden or <laughs> like something like, uh, well, Patty's other show, uh, Everybody Loves Raymond. The children yeah. were a very small part of that show. Right. They had children, but they, I didn't watch it all that often, but I couldn't even tell you what the kids look like. <laughs> I never, I don't think I ever saw an episode with the kids in it. They, they definitely were not the predominant focus by any means. No. No. It just made sense for the characters to be parents, so. Yeah. Well, I was like, with the, the middle, the fact that they, they showed just enough of Mike's life at the quarry that you knew what he did, but not so much that you wanted to spend but so much time there. <laughs> if that makes sense? Yeah. They had... Um... Well, it was there enough to introduce some um, um, auxiliary yeah. characters, if that's the right word. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and yeah, it, it was there if it would was going to come in handy. And you know what I've thought in the past, in the beginning, the first, well, probably five years or so, um, Patty Heaton's character worked at a car dealership, maybe mm -hmm. longer than five years. But I think from the beginning... Well, one, if you're going to have a story about people, they need to have jobs. Uh, not, hey, no, someone's trying to be <laughs> what a the? spam risk tried to break into our private chat here. No Come way. Uh, I know. Um, anyway, it occurred to me that people have to have jobs, except sometimes they do. The friends, people really have jobs. Eh, some kind of. Mostly they <laughs> hung out in the apartment. But... <laughs> Uh, Patty had that job in case the family didn't work out well. He could have shifted over to being mostly. She she would have spent a lot more time at work. Yeah. If work if that was the where the comedy was, right. and and not in the home. But the, after a while, they realized pretty much that the, the the house was was carrying its own weight, and so yeah. didn't rely on. You know, Brian Doyle Murray played her boss we now mentioned two of the murray brothers in this podcast yeah um he played her boss and uh i know in the, this was a scene where uh he was his his boss would fire her from the car dealership that's what they were yeah. shooting yeah. i saw him before they went off to do it and when he came back i said so brian did you fire patty and he goes i think i fired myself <laughs> <laughs> his character <laughs> if patty doesn't work there anymore what are we gonna do with you? So, yeah, he was he was right about that. <laughs> um, let's see. We're just over the over the run of the show. Did you have any particular favorite episodes that stand out in your mind? That um, is a, uh, a a common question, I'm sure. and I, it's it's common enough that I should have an answer to it. <laughs> But I, I, I never did. As, I don't mean common, but I mean, I've been asked that before. It's a logical thing to ask. Hmm. Um, but no, and I never even uh, thought to make one up. <laughs> I, didn't, um, I mean, to, you know, just throw out any episode. Oh, I love the one with the swimming pool and the escaped lion, if that was one of those. Sure. Uh, no, I always liked, uh, I liked scenes when we were in the car, I usually liked shooting oh, yeah. those. Yeah. Um, but uh, mostly because, well, I guess we would uh, do a lot of talking. You're there for a long time. And when we're all sitting in the car, the camera's only rolling maybe half the time. Yeah. Other times they're making adjustments or talking about this or that. So we did a lot of talking and goofing around. <laughs> that was always fun. And with Patty, uh, we had a lot of scenes in the bedroom, <laughs> never involving physical contact, just <laughs> usually going to bed to sleep for the night. Um, I always enjoyed that because there'd be long scenes, uh, kind of the scene that you might do in an acting class, uh, yeah. just two people and four pages long or whatever. Yeah. And um, I never thought of this i don't think and uh people out there should know if you're a young actor doing those scenes in acting class the ads are really really against ever playing a scene like that uh professionally 
<laughs> it's because they just they rarely exist. I mean, to have two people talking for four pages is not usual. If you're again, if you're a movie star, yeah, it's going to happen. Yeah. I've never had pages of dialogue in a movie because I'm not a movie star. I've only appeared. But it's it's a rarity. Even on TV, you don't see two people getting into bed and chatting for um, whatever three or four minutes. They just there's no time to indulge that. I think so. That was really uh, always enjoyable. And again, because so much time is spent with the camera not rolling, yeah. Patty and I would often just hang out there on the set and just keep talking about whatever we were talking about in between uh, in between takes. I so. so I don't mean to discourage you young actors out there, but if you're, it's more like um, if you're in that situation, you've done something right. Yeah. You've gotten lucky or you're very good or you know somebody, your dad's the producer. I don't know what, <laughs> but it's just, it's just not that common to be able to play a one-on-one a -on -one scene with somebody for pages at a time. I will say, I think my single favorite moment uh, of yours in the entire run of the middle was you, uh, playing air guitar to more than a feeling in the car. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just the, the combination of uh, you doing it coupled with the reaction of Patty and the kids in the car right. next to you was just... So seemingly out of character. Yes, absolutely. You know what? I don't know if I... I know I was singing along. I don't know if I was playing the air guitar. You were making but something I do know. hand gesture. <laughs> Say what? You're making some sort of hand gesture which approximated a guitar anyway. Okay, fair enough. But I want uh, what I want to say is that I know, in a strange coincidence, that I did play air guitar to more than a feeling on Scrubs. You did indeed, yes. By sheer coincidence, it was the same song <laughs> on both shows. <laughs> and um, when we did it on Scrubs, Donald was uh, doing the air singing, I guess. And... Yeah. Um, and Sam Lloyd, our good friend who recently right. passed away, thinking yeah. of you, Sam. Uh, he was there. And then Mike, one of the writers, played the drummer. Yes. Uh, um, yeah. And I wore sunglasses only because I was afraid of feeling stupid. <laughs> and I wanted to hide. <laughs> it just felt that it turned out fine, but I thought, uh, it feels a little dumb. I don't know. So I hid my eyes. <laughs> it's all worked out well in the end, thankfully. Yeah, it's all it's all turned out okay. But if you ever see that episode, all I have to do is it goes more than a feeling, more than a feeling as a background singer and yeah. bass player. In my head, I was playing the bass, <laughs> but that's all I had to do was move my mouth to more than a feeling, and I and I muff it. I came in late. <laughs> if you ever see the episode, watch my mouth. I. In retrospect, maybe the sunglasses were a good idea. Yep. That's probably... Well, you know, I missed the line because I think I was thinking, I sure I'm glad I'm wearing these sunglasses. <laughs> and, oh, that's me. More than I feel it. <laughs> Nobody got hurt. It worked out okay. Thank God. Thank God for that. Mm -hmm. um, I know. I'll head toward the, the home stretch here, but uh, when you mentioned the movie star thing, it did occur to me that you have at least two Harrison Ford movies in your back catalog. That's yeah, that's bad. right. Yeah, that's not bad. I've, yeah, I worked with Hayfo a couple of times. Uh, he wouldn't take my acting tips. Wasn't listening. Wouldn't wouldn't indulge. Um, yeah, glad to pick up a little. I was glad to be in both of them, of course. But yeah. uh, but I didn't think um, the the Crystal Skull thing. I didn't think I did very well in that. <laughs> it's just one of those things where you go. Eh. Fortunately, I've only thought of it a couple of times. But um, I did an NYPD Blue that I wish I'd have done better. Yeah. But um, I guess maybe I'm, I should be ashamed or maybe I should feel <laughs> lucky, as I do, that it's only a couple times that I've thought, eh, I should have done better. But um, Crystal Skull is one of them for some yeah, reason. Yeah, whose idea was it to tie uh, the fugitive into the scrubs? I don't know. Yeah. Um, I don't know, but it was told to me over the summer, the writers had gone back before the everyone else does, you know, the writers get a head start on the upcoming season. Yeah. Yeah. Mark Stegman, one of the writers said that this is going to happen. <laughs> they show me in the fugitive on scrubs and I thought, 
what in the, how do you explain that away? And by the time, if not by the time we were doing it, not long afterwards, I thought this, it doesn't matter at all. <laughs> it's an episode of a TV show that's a comedy and it's, my world is kind of a bizarre one anyway. So, so what? It, it doesn't hold up the logic. It doesn't matter. But uh, yeah, that was, I don't know if that's ever been done before <clears throat> or since, but it was uh, strange to, for those who don't know what we're talking about, to on a TV show, have a clip of that actor in a movie appear on the show. I don't know if anyone's ever done that. Um, I'm not sure. That was my, um, somebody said to me once, someone from high school, what was it like to, to, to break through so early? I said, early? I got, I got scrubs at 40 years old. And he said, well, the fugitive. Man, do you know that that was one day's work? One day? I was unemployed the next day. And besides, it's only four seconds of film or whatever it is. That's not quite breaking through. I was glad to take the few hundred dollars that they gave me, but... And we shot it technically, actually, it was at night. They shot it on the, the L in Chicago. Yeah, um, yeah I was glad to be there. But uh, then people ask me, you know, when you did, when I did the Indiana Jones thing, did you, did you mention to Harrison Ford that you'd worked together before? No. For one, I don't think I spoke to him one-on-one -on -one at all. Uh, and two, I, I was afraid he'd say, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, that's right. We can't have the same, you know, he probably wouldn't have said that at all, but it just wasn't worth mentioning. Continuity and is very important to Harrison Ford, I understand. He's a very serious man. Yeah. He's got his his fingers on every aspect of filmmaking, from what I understand. Um, yeah, I didn't, uh, if, if people are friendly and like a lot of times, especially I think on a TV show, yeah. the regular actors are happy to have someone different to talk to, yeah. you know, especially, I guess, if they don't get along with each other. Sure. But so it changes from show to show, but people and person to person or yeah. day to day, the, the mood that person's in, or if they have to concentrate on that particular scene, they're not going to want to chat. It doesn't, you know, you can't make assumptions about what's going to happen, but I generally don't try to talk to someone who's a, you know, above me in status wise, unless they, you know, I, I'm, I mostly speak when spoken to. As you far as that goes. You ever heard people come over and fanboy on you on the set? I wouldn't say no, certainly not with adoration or anything, <laughs> uh, but people, people would want to talk, but I was always up for that. I didn't, that was fine. If I was, uh, like I didn't want anyone uh, who's guesting on the show to be uh, eating alone at, at lunch. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so I'd either invite them over to where we were sitting or go sit with them. You know. Excuse me, my TV came back on. I understand. I should mute it. Um, I will tell you though that on the fugitive, this is now probably three in the morning, and we're on this L platform between setups and. I walk by as Harrison Ford is not talking with, but uh, being talked to by a person, <laughs> probably uh, you know one of the background passengers on the L car. Yeah. But as I pass by, I hear this guy saying, "Because if you think about it, the Wookies actually were established prior to the blah blah blah, whatever the hell it was." He's talking about the logic of the Star Wars sequence and. I just thought, oh, brother, he must be in hell. <laughs> he probably gets that. He probably gets that more than once. People coming up. I have to tell you, my favorite scene, although it didn't stand up logically, was when you were frozen solid. Oh my god. Well, I guess that comes with being part of a. Um, come to think of it, he's got a couple, doesn't he? Because Indiana Jones would be that too. Yeah. What would you absolutely. call that? Sort of an iconic thing, like like. The people from Star Trek or this sort of thing where you're where you have avid followers. And Shatner overcame that eventually. Um, yeah. But there's the danger early that 
this is it. You're you're this character, and no one's going to believe you're anything else. Um, the dreaded albatross. Yeah, it's probably. I don't know. You know what? You know what? I strangely enough, I was trying to think of an actor who couldn't break out of the the, the pigeonhole of their first big role. Mm -hmm. But I, and then I thought of some, some. I was gonna say like Max Headroom. Oh, yeah. Now that's only something that we remember, and it didn't really last or become iconic or anything. <laughs> but that guy, I actually just saw him, and I could almost think of his name. He Matt played Fruer. the judge on Perry Mason. Matt Furrer. Max what? Matt Matt Furrer. Matt Furrer, right? You're right. I've interviewed Matt, him. That's why I know, know your that. name. <laughs> You've interviewed him before, okay? Yeah. Um. Now he might have thought it faded away within the year. No one cared anymore. But its premiere, if you recall, was a big. Uh, I watched it. Oh yeah, absolutely. It was supposed to like you know change TV or whatever, and it it, it really didn't. But he, Matt was taking a little chance there, I suppose, by being that guy. Yeah. But at least he had the advantage of having that makeup on, so you couldn't necessarily tell it was him. Yep. Yep. That's right. And. It only occurred to me when I did something with prosthetics that like if you're going to do something like Star Trek or the new Star Trek or whatever, when mm. like say, if you're going to play Worf. Right. Uh, and that's just about all I know about the next generation. But that I'm actor, impressed though. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, that actor turns out is a very handsome guy yeah. under all that makeup. But he's not someone that you knew who it was when the show started. Right. And from my own experience with prosthetics, I know why. Nobody with a career already will do it. Because <laughs> the pain to go, you mean you got to go in whatever, two hours before, if not more, and one hour <laughs> after, take it off. Plus, no one can see your face. <laughs> so no, no established actor is going to do that. Now, what, you, what did you do with prosthetics? I think I did it a couple times on Scrubs. I might have done something else. But on Scrubs, once I played an old man, and then later, like a giant in the, in the fairy tale episode, oh, excuse yeah. me. So I know I did it a couple times where they have to make a mold of your face and you put straws up your nose while this rubber dries. And yeah. it was a, a little bit fun to be doing this, you know, say, well, I'm doing this. I never can I always say I did this, but uh, no, it's not something you'd want to do on a regular basis. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I feel like I've kept you long enough, but uh, I, I should say, you. Yeah, there you go. I appreciate you being willing to do this. So Neil, it's good to get a chance to actually talk to you as opposed to just trade the occasional email. Yes. No, I, 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 I'll I, I, bard you I, with I, messages unless I have an actual question that I, I need answering. Like the like when we talked about Battle of the Network Stars that time. <laughs> yes, that that well, that is definitely something that I thought who who would have ever dreamed I would do this, <laughs> have the chance to do this. So what the heck, do it. <laughs> like having rubber on your face and straws up your nose. Sure. What the heck? I'll do it once. <laughs> But yeah, no, it was good talking to you. I enjoyed it. Excellent. Well, uh, we stay safe, stay semi-sane, and uh, I will uh, talk to you whenever your next project rolls around, I hope. Very good. I hope, yeah, I hope we're all working not too far from now. Take Me care. Too. You too, man. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Appreciate it. See you.